Hello and welcome to K-Pod, the podcast about Korean Americans in arts and culture from Korean American Story. I'm Juliana Sohn, a photographer. And I'm Katherine Hong, a writer and editor. Today, we're delighted to be speaking with actor and director Peter Kim. Kim most recently starred in Wild Goose Dreams at the Public Theater, written by South Korean playwright Han Sol Jung. Kim played Min Sung, a South Korean man who lives and works in Seoul while his wife and child live in the United States. Kim received wonderful reviews for his performance, including Ben Brantley in the New York Times, who referred to his lovely, low-key air of bewilderment. Kim grew up in New Jersey and studied acting at NYU and at the Yale School of Drama. He made his Broadway debut in Thoroughly Modern Millie, and he's worked off-Broadway at Playwrights Horizon, Signature Theatre Company, and Second Stage Theatre. His TV and film credits include Chicago Med, Louie, Ugly Betty, and the Emmy Award-winning series After Forever. He's also a lecturer in theatre at Princeton and associate producer of the National Asian American Theatre Company. We are so pleased to be speaking with Peter today. So we would love to hear, I guess, your story from the beginning. How you grew up, sure. when did you move here, or yeah, were yeah, you born yeah. Here? I was born in the Bronx, actually, but raised in uh, New Jersey, in Bergen County specifically. Uh, my parents are Korean immigrants. Um, they have a really interesting story, actually. But uh, uh, the the short version is that um, they actually met in Germany. Uh, my dad was a coal miner and my mom was a nurse. Um, there was a, an exchange program between uh, Germany and Korea, South Korea at the time, where Germany needed a workforce. So um, my parents met there and then they actually got married there and had my oldest sister, Christina, there. And then they moved to the States in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, so my two other sisters were born uh, here and as I was. And... Um, you know, I was really fortunate at a very young age in grammar school. My music teacher, uh, Linda, she um, was like, hey, you should audition for the school play. And I was like, what? OK, sure. And it was a Christmas show called The Mall, The Night Visitors. And and then actually from fifth grade all through college, she ended up becoming my mentor um, and kind of like my surrogate mother slash manager. Um, I started acting professionally when I was in high school. I was with a, a theater company called City Kids in the city. And um, my first professional gig was actually doing a public service announcement for City Kids with Demi Moore. Wow. Um, yeah. And then um, that was like my junior year of high school, I think. Um, she really uh, guided my career. And I really would not even be an actor today if it wasn't for her. Um, I've been really fortunate to have a number of mentors in my life um, throughout my career, like Mia Katigbach, who is a co-founder of NatCo, the National Asian American Theater Company. She hired me uh, right out of NYU um, for a show at NatCo. And um, NatCo has been sort of my home away from home over the many, many years I've been in the industry. And now I came on board as the associate producer of NatCo about, I think it's been about five years now. And that, again, it was, you know, my career was sort of, it was, this was after Yale where I got my MFA in acting. Um, I'd sort of kind of just felt like, oh man, there's like, being an actor is rough, you know, and you have so little control um, or kind of agency. Um, and that was kind you know, I, I guess I'm an unintentional activist. So I was like, I need to figure out another way of being creative. And that's when, um, I was starting to have this itch towards producing and I went to Mia and just said, Hey, I don't have any money. I can't fund a production, but I can give you my sweat equity and, you know, will you let me shadow you and learn how to be a producer? And she said, yes. I am a big believer of mentorship because I've been um, the recipient of incredible mentorship. And that's why now in my career as a producer and now also as a lecturer at Princeton, where I teach acting, um, I get to be the mentor now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, art activism, mentorship, it's all kind of linked 
for me, and it can be a really powerful thing. Tell us about your parents a little bit. They're yeah. in business. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, you know, my, <laughs> I, I mean, we, I feel like I should do a whole podcast on my parents because they're coal kind of, miner, that's yeah, so they're so, uh, yeah, I mean, and it's, you know, that movie that came out, Ode to My Father, is similar to what my parents' journey was, um, except uh, they came to the States. And so when they came to the States, my dad was actually a janitor. Um, and then while well, my mom was a registered nurse, and then he uh, was a New York City cab driver, and he still drives like a cab driver, which is terrifying. <laughs> and then he got an opportunity to uh, buy like a discount store in Jersey City. So he did that. And through saving money and stuff, then they started investing in real estate in New York. And then they had a toy store in Bushwick where me and my sisters basically grew up and we worked, you know, we were open every day. We on Christmas, we'd get up and go to work on Christmas. You're open and, on Christmas. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. For the last minute. Uh, exactly. Dinner. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we'd go to church Christmas Eve night, and you know, at like midnight mass, and then get up at like seven a.m., open the presents, and then get in the van to go to work. You know, it's funny because I to this day I'm like ah toys, Ugh, they're a waste of money. You know, <laughs> Bunch of junk. yeah. I'm like I'm like I was like like the grouchiest like you know curmudgeonliest you know ten year old out there. <laughs> They still own that building, actually, in Bushwick, and I help manage it for them. When you told them that you want to study acting, yes. tell us a little bit about that Yeah, reaction. that was tough. I mean, because, you know, I had been acting a lot from a young age, and then when I was acting professionally, which means you were getting paid to act, it started to sort of shift their perspective. But when I was applying for colleges, they were really uncomfortable with me pursuing a degree in acting. It's weird. They were always supportive of me acting, but I think they definitely had to grapple with like, how are you going to make a living? Like, how, how are you going to do this? And definitely my mentor, Linda, did have to talk to them and say like, you know, he's really talented. Like he can make a career out of this. And it wasn't really until I booked a, a feature film called Hackers. That was actually Angelina Jolie's first feature film. We shot in New York and in London. And when I was shooting in New York in the meatpacking district, I invited my parents to set. Because I just thought, like, this would be cool, you know, and like, I had my own trailer and stuff. And, you know, I was like 19 at the time. And so I remember they came to set and they saw like what a production it was and like how Much massive money was, money was mm -hmm. being spent that they were like, oh, OK. And then they knew how much I was getting paid for it, too. So once they knew I could make money and make a living at acting, then it definitely assuaged their fears. So you just have to tell us, what did you play in Hackers? <laughs> Describe this role. I played um, Blade, him and his brother Razor. So they were Razor and Blade. They were like these elite hackers that had this kind of like cable access downtown underground TV show about how to hack and stuff. And they were, um, they were really cool. They were very flamboyant. They, they were, yeah. I mean, it's funny because I went to audition for it. Initially, they were described as like B-boys. And then as the costuming happened and the, the costume designer and the art direction happened. And they, the they, eyeliner. The, the eyeliner, yeah. They <laughs> definitely pushed us to this place where it was like, are we almost like drag queens? You know, at the time, that movie came out in 96. And I think talking about sexuality and gender was not like the conversations we're having now. And I think these, for me, I think they were trying to push the envelope about sexuality and gender with these characters. It's and a great first role. Yeah. it was, And it's amazing how many people still are like, oh, that's the guy from, <laughs> you know, funny. Packers. It was a really cool, fun experience. And I feel so fortunate to have had that experience because I think... You know, with a lot of Asian parents, immigrant parents in particular, the concern is really like, can you make a living? Right. I think it's different for boys. You're the, or are you the only boy in the I family? I am. I am the youngest of four. I have three older sisters. You, you had this production called Sides. Yes. And uh, it was really interesting, the premise of it, which is all these sides that people are asked to um, audition with. Yes. Yeah. And it, I think a lot of it had to do with stereotypical Asian characters. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that production? Sure. And uh, what was your role in it? I mean, yeah. did you write? Did you produce? Um, yeah, we, all of the above. Um, it really started with like me and five close um, Asian American actor friends. And we were just really just frustrated with like, 
like the terrible material that we were getting, but also, you know, we we're starting out, we just couldn't get cast. And we we're like, what are we like, eh, you know, and so. So just, what's the year? This is about, um, I'd say this is like the early 2000s. You know, some of us had like worked on Broadway, some of us hadn't. And, you know, we we're just like frustrated with our careers, essentially. And so Sakia Billman, who was one of the members, she had this idea of like, let's just gather all of these, like our sides that we've had and try to create something around them. And so sides was basically, we called it like loosely knit sketch, where all six of us would um, kind of come up with characters, we'd come up with the premise, we'd come up with the situation, and we'd just test different things out through improv. And then um, Mayi Theater, specifically Ralph Pena, who's the artistic director there, he had, we had done like little like kind of like showings of it and he was like, oh, there's something there. And then he was the one that programmed it as part of my season. And we ended up doing a show where, uh, you know, it was, it was basically scripted, you know, um, where we got to do it. And it was a big like off Broadway hit. And then um, in 2000, I think it was 2005, we ended up doing it self-producing and doing it um, off Broadway. Even though like we were all Asian American and that was on our forefront, we never kind of led with that in our comedy. It was more like humiliation was actually <laughs> the baseline. <laughs> um, but we also knew the impact that it would have seeing six Asian Americans on stage. So, But we were walking this very delicate line where we knew that just by being six Asian American actors, we were going to be making a statement, a political statement, an activist statement. But we never actually really incorporated it into the specific material. There's like one skit that maybe we leaned oh, into I it, see. but otherwise, so it was really interesting to see like people's reaction to the piece and how they interpret it just by the fact that we were six Asian American mm -hmm. actors, though the content was never about uh, that. I always assumed that you were all being asked to read these very stereotypical characters. That yeah, no, no, okay. actually. I mean, some of them, yeah, because like some of the writing was terrible and stuff like that. But, um, but we, you know, we weren't doing like, I don't know, like Delivery, dragon, Boy. Delivery Boys yeah. or Dragon Ladies. Now, and stuff like have that. you been asked to do such kinds of auditions? I know you've done commercials. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, I, I, it's a good, it's a, it's an interesting thing, you know. So I made my Broadway debut in Thoroughly Modern Millie, and my character, Bun Fu, actually sings and speaks in Mandarin Cantonese, neither of which languages I know at all. And, you know, I got that job right out of grad school. I was actually still in grad school. I was in my third year and I booked it. And so um, I was really excited to make my Broadway debut. And I had seen the show and I actually loved it. And Francis Jew, who was playing the part orig or and originated the role, I would be taking over for him. He was an actor I really admired. And, you know, I auditioned for it and I had to sing and speak in Mandarin. So I was just learning it phonetically. And I ended up getting the job. And now years later... You know, um, I have very mixed feelings about that experience. I was so grateful for the experience and to make my Broadway debut with it. But I don't think that the characters were stereotypical at all. Can some, you just some explain people, it for those who yeah, don't know? Yeah, I mean, there were what? these two brothers that um, basically were laundry guys. The show takes place in the 19... Uh, 20s and they worked for this kind of like evil you know woman who actually was a kind of like has been actress who was disguising herself as being Chinese and we were kind of like her minions we worked for her but you know at the end of the play my brother the character of my brother gets the girl and my character actually called like is able to re reveal who uh, this woman is and what a fraud she is you know they were the heroes actually so that that was my kind of like grappling with those characters but I know my peers some of them really do not agree with that but my assessment of those characters they found it offensive they found it offensive they found it stereotypical which is fine I guess my concern really was the fact that when I was performing it and there were like you know Chinese tourists coming and I I was doing a disservice to the language and to the culture actually because I did not speak those like I did the best I could you know to learn it and all that but you know in hindsight I don't I don't know if I would have auditioned for it now because being able to speak or at least have an approximation of the language is so fundamental to those characters. You know, I can't really blame myself fully, but this idea of creatives and who's in control, I do question like why finding an actor to play those parts, why the language skill 
was not at the forefront mm-hmm. of a mm-hmm. casting decision. Um, it's because who's doing the casting, really? Well, you know, then, who's like in the who, position? Who's in the room? Yeah. Who's the director? Who's the writers? You know, and like I and I know these people, and they're all incredibly well intentioned, incredibly supportive of diversity in the arts and Asian American representation. And mind you, this is like in two thousand four, so this is. 14 years ago. I think the landscape is very different now. It's um, amazing how much has changed yes. in such a short time. So, you know, I may have been out of a job, but maybe that would have been okay. Because I just think about those audience members that were not seeing themselves and their culture depicted um, as authentically as it could have been. That being said, the original actors in those parts were ethnically Chinese and did have working knowledge or uh, basic knowledge of uh, Mandarin and Cantonese. But it was ironic that the both of the replacement actors were Korean American. Oh, your sibling yeah, was, was as well. also Korean American. I mean, you know, there are plenty of Korean Americans that can also speak Mandarin and Cantonese, but I'm just not one of them. You know, just looking at the way casting works, there are not that many options to. Yeah, it's definitely you, been. It's, so. Yeah, I mean, it's really exciting to see. I think they're calling it like Asian August or yes. something like that. Yes. Yeah. So it's really exciting to see that happen. You know, I'm part of the generation that saw Margaret Cho's TV show mm-hmm. and then see it flop um, and then see this vast, many, many years of just like no representation at all. I mean, that's why Wild Goose Dreams is so important to me. Because um, I actually left acting about three years ago. At that point, I was really just so frustrated with my career as an actor. By that point, I had done some producing with NACO, and that was feeling really, really good. At that time, I was also dealing with some big family issues. So I, I just couldn't, you know, I had a panic attack. And I was like, okay, something has to change. So I spoke to my manager and my agents at the time and told them I need to break. I need a break. I have to just leave because my family stuff is just too important right now. Like literally the day after I made that hard decision, I told my reps that I'm out for I don't know how long. And they were super supportive. I got a call from my friend slash colleague, Susie Agins. And she was like, hey, you know, I teach at Princeton and one of our senior thesis projects is this play called Charles Francis Chan Jr.'s Exotic Oriental Murder Mystery by Lloyd Sa. I was in that play. I originated one of the roles. NACO commissioned the play. It was a New York Times critics pick when we did it, you know, the year before. And she's like, you know, the student proposed it. And she's like, I thought of you immediately. And I, I, I think you should direct it. And I was like, oh, I'm like, I've never directed really before. I don't know if I can do this. She's like, no, we'll just just interview and we'll, you know, I, we'll see. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I interviewed and I got it. I ended up directing it, you know, like six months later. It was truly like a life-changing experience. So you're a lecturer at Princeton now. Did this directing job lead to this position at Princeton? 100%. And tell us a little bit about, yeah. you know, what your role is there. So when I, um, so I directed the show and that was first time on Princeton's campus that they had basically like an Asian American cast slash story being told on their campus. And it was a big success, like sold out houses. You know, we had to like turn people away because we were so crowded. Uh, It had an amazing impact on the student body because, you know, Princeton is like 23% Asian or Asian American. And um, Jane Cox, who is a phenomenal lighting designer, she also is head of the theater program at Princeton. And she asked if I'd be interested in teaching there. And I was like, yeah, of course. So then last spring was my first semester teaching acting there. And I'll be going back in January to teach again. I've been thinking a lot about my mentors especially Liz, because I was a sophomore when I met her, a sophomore in undergrad. And so I get to be the mentor to these students. And, you know, in all of my years of training, I never had an Asian American professor in theater or acting. The closest thing would be Mia. And so to be able to be that person for this other generation, I it's so impactful. I had like five Asian or Asian American students in my first class. And I am sure just having a professor that looked like me teaching them, I think had some impact. It's so important that like the staff is populated with people, with diverse people, minorities, um, POCs. It makes a difference. 
I love that you got this call and everything kind of fell in your lap. It's really, it I mean, meant to be. yeah, it's, I, and yeah, I mean, really that call from Susie really kind of changed my life, you know. And then, then how did this role come about because yeah, you were taking a break from acting? Yeah, so I, you know, it's funny, like I took a break and then like, little projects kind of came along um like one was um this movie called saturday church which was in um, the tribeca film festival actually and it follows the story of a young 15 year old boy who is dealing with his sexuality and gender and i have a pretty pivotal role in that film that movie kind of came along it was a role i type of role i'd never played before i don't want to give any spoilers i've never played a role like that i asked my parents not to watch the movie uh so anyway it's on amazon it's on like a lot of different um streaming venues it's called saturday church and then a friend recommended me for this uh web series called after forever which then all of a sudden has been like blowing up so it's weird it's like i took a break and it just freed me. Like, I just felt so liberated. And like, I don't know, like being a, being an actor, you just feel like all this pressure, like you have to like audition for everything. You have to, you have to. But the the rejection can really take a toll. So um, when you took a break, you yeah. didn't actively go and audition. Yeah, so I purposely said to my reps, like, please don't send me anything. Um, and so except, then you like, waited for these things and they came to you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my manager would be in conversation with my agent and you know, my, my reps wanted me to still know what was coming my way mm-hmm. what when people were asking for me and then I could kind of make the decision. But my manager was there also kind of filtering through and really just kind of like picking and choosing the ones that she thought desert, like would, would be maybe pique my interest. And so, yeah, I really just did these projects that kind of scared me and interested me in terms of wild goose dreams you know i saw the studio production here at the public two years ago and i was blown away by it i thought it was so moving and beautiful and then when the audition came my way i actually was like i wasn't going to audition for it it was my manager and my husband michael who were both like you i don't know you might want to consider this and i was like Oh, okay but i had a real resistance to it i don't really know why i think something about the role i just couldn't see myself in it. I don't know why, but some, there was a block there. And then I just ended up auditioning anyway, and then I got it. And luckily, I knew Hansel from before. I'd done a workshop of one of her other pieces. I knew Lee Silverman, the director, because we had worked on Kung, Kung Fu together and some other projects. I mean, even in the first few days of rehearsal, I didn't really know why I got cast. <laughs> I was like, why? why me? Like, why? I don't really know. And then eventually I, I figured it out. And the thing that I think I bring to the role is partly to do with being Korean American specifically. I, I say like the word chamo comes up a lot. And chamo is like a, like swallow. It's like what my grandma used to say to me when I was crying. She'd be like, chamo, chamo. And I think that's a very Korean thing where like we will acknowledge having all the feelings, but then we're asked to swallow them. We're asked and it's basically like endure through the suffering. And a friend of mine who's Korean American said, yeah, you know, her mom told her love is how much you're willing to suffer for someone. And I was like, that's so Korean, you know? And I think that's part of the reason why Min Sung, the character I play in Wild Goose Dreams, does what he does. And why I think so many Goose Fathers do, because they're like, I'm going to endure this for the benefit of my children. And I think just growing up in a Korean household, I, I think I fundamentally understood what chamo is. And also being able to play this juxtaposition of having all the feelings, but then being able to cap it until he can't endure it anymore and it all falls apart. I think one of the aspects of your character that I thought was so incredibly powerful was that he, he seems so um, kind of upbeat and always very positive and uh, willing to see the best or hope, hoping for uh, the best outcome. And then in one of the scenes, you get a sense of how much he is really suffering inside. Mm. And then, but when he speaks again, it's just like with this almost like fake put on, like, it's okay. Yeah. And it, it's just so heartbreaking to see that character break for that second. Yeah. I think that's like one of the amazing things about playing this character is that he's like a bleeding heart, you know? He really does believe and has so much hope, you know? But then on the flip side, it's like, well, that's also kind of a denial, you know? Um, and I always say that, so Michelle Krusek plays Nani, and I always feel like it's, I mean, you know, for folks who are listening, I hope they can come see the show um, and see for themselves. But I, I just think like her character is so strong, 
you know, she is a survivor and she just has skills of survival that Min Sung doesn't. But that that sort of survival and that strength also comes at a cost for her. And um, would you say this is the meatiest role you've played? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's such an honor. I, you know, like kudos to the public for programming this play. You know, we're in this gorgeous set. Like they they definitely sunk some cash into mm-hmm. this production. And so it feels really not that money equals worth, but uh, that's very Korean, um, <laughs> <laughs> at least in my my upbringing. But it does show it says it sends a message yes. to the community at large that like it validates we, we are valued and investing yeah. in this voice, which you know, a lot of theaters um, in town, they will take a, a POC playwright or a minority playwright and give them a venue. But it's like, we'll give you the smallest venue with the mm-hmm. smallest budget because we don't want to take that risk. We're like, we're scared. So it does send a real message to the community when a very storied institution like the public provides this opportunity. And without this opportunity, I wouldn't have this opportunity for this really meaty, probably the meat, like you were saying, probably the meatiest role of my career. And I've been doing this professionally for over 25 years. Well, it probably is such a refreshing change to be playing a Korean character who's not Korean as opposed to the outsider. I mean, yeah. his Koreanness is not the pivotal part right. of the plot. Yeah, definitely. This is probably the most Korean play I've done as opposed to Mm Korean-American, you know, it takes place in Seoul. Like there's Korean writing all over the walls in the set, you know. Um, So it's been a really cool experience to kind of reconnect to my Korean self in that way. And and then also, you know, I I sing two songs in Korean and, you know, my Korean is very basic. It's like that of a five-year-old. So, you know, I, some of the, some of the Korean, I had a kind of, like, I could hear it once I heard, Mm -hmm. like, someone saying it. So my ear for it was there, but some of it I had to kind of learn phonetically so that I could really understand it. You know, full disclosure, I, I still have a lot of, like, guilt and embarrassment over the fact that I can't speak Korean as well as I wish I could. And it was a really, it was a big stumbling block for me to be able to sing in Korean because, and kind of like with my experience with Millie, you know, I was like, I want to really be able to reflect my community, you know, as authentically and truthfully as I can and do it justice, Mm -hmm. you know. All I can say is like I'm doing better with the Korean than I did with the cha- the <laughs> Cantonese and the Mandarin. So, <laughs> you know, with the Wild Goose Dreams, it made me confront a lot of these stereotypes and maybe ideas I had of um, Korean men, and it made me think, you know, why do I think that this character is going to be that or should be that? And then it sort of strips away all these stereotypes and expectations, and it's amazing that your character is really just an individual. He's him. He doesn't encapsulate like so many, I mean, and by being so specifically just him, he- Yeah, I think that's the burden of being a POC, especially in this industry, because especially being Asian American, we have so few examples of representation that you do feel the burden. You feel the burden of like, I know I'm the only one on this, like oftentimes, as an actor, a POC actor, like you'll be a part of an ensemble and you're like the only one or like the only Asian one. But that was a conscious decision on the creators because they, they realized as they were putting this cast together, they were like, oh, wait a second. Like we don't have as much diversity as we want. So, you know, I am the only Asian American character on that series. And yeah, so there is a little bit of a burden because, you know, we're like, well, I'm the only one and I want to make sure I represent us like fully and 100%. But then you're like, ah, you know, like sometimes we're flawed. Like I'm, that's yeah. what I think is so refreshing about playing Min Sung is like, and I've had, I've had the ability to play multi-dimensional characters that are Asian in the past as well. But he is totally flawed and, and we don't get to see ourselves reflected in like as POCs don't get to see themselves reflected as individuals versus like a stand in for an entire mm-hmm. community. Mm-hmm. It is very refreshing to be able to play him. I, I think there's this um, move for creative people 
to make their own projects happen. If you don't see it out there, it's for, you know, middle-aged women who are actresses and, uh, you know, Reese Witherspoon, who started her own production company and um, took on projects and gave roles to other middle-aged women. And I think it's so proactive instead of just sitting there back and complaining, waiting for something to happen, that you start writing, that you start producing, that you form a group. I love that this is a, a form of creative activism and it just takes on percent. this incredibly positive way of dealing with issues yeah that's the power of art activism and you know when i was starting out in my career as an uh, as an actor i always had inclinations to like for directing and producing but i I don't know. I feel like it's different now where like having all those hyphens, you know, in terms of your title is like kind of normal now. But, you know, when I was coming up, it it wasn't. You were sort of like put in the box. Like you're a playwright, you're an actor, you're a director. Like I would say that if regardless if you're emerging or if you're established or if you're just starting out, if you have any inclination to do anything else, especially if you're an actor, if you have any inclination to direct, produce, make music, like if you have any inclination, pursue it. But it seems like you've it's, had like so many of these moments that are so impressive on your resume. Oh, that thank you. It's really interesting to hear you say that you had given it up at some point. Yeah. But I'm sure the day-to-day of the auditions and so many, I mean, we read about on the, um, you know, online of all the things that did happen, but there are so many probably auditions that didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of disappointments. Mm -hmm. And then also the real lesson too was like life, my family, you know, sometimes life happens and you got to, you need to be there for your family. You just slipped in there that you were married. Yeah. And that your husband's name is Michael. Yeah. Could you please talk about what it's like being a gay Asian man? Totally. You know, uh, as I was telling you guys before, like my parents are very Catholic. Um, My uncle is Father Nam. He has a congregation in the Bronx. And it's definitely been a journey for my parents. Um, When did you come out? I came out to them in my early 20s. And it was definitely hard for them. It kind of became like a don't ask, don't tell Mm -hmm. policy until I met Michael. My dad said it to my sisters, too. He's like, I don't need to meet anyone until you're ready to marry them. That's exactly what yep. my parents... Don't bring anyone don't home. Don't bring anyone home unless you're going to marry them. So <laughs> I I kind of took that to heart, too, you know? So I was like, all right, I'm not going to... Well, you know. So I met Michael... Uh, like uh, We've been together for about 13 years now. And we got married about three years ago. You know, so when I met him and I knew he was the guy for me is when I introduced him to my parents. And it was definitely... Um, You know, they were always kind to him, no matter what. And it wasn't until we decided to get married that was very hard for my parents. Uh, I think the sacrament of marriage, Mm -hmm. even though we were not getting married in a church or anything, for them it's still a sacrament of marriage. And then being as devout Catholic as they are, I think that was very hard for them. I'm happy to say that they love Michael like family now. Do they still have stuff around um having a gay son that's married yes but getting married was probably the was almost harder than coming out to them really through the support of my sisters and my brother-in-laws and my friends my parents really came around to it and they came to the wedding um there was there was a yeah my mom you know i knew she was going to come like a month before the wedding but my dad he was really really struggling with it you know, it got to a point where I told him like a month before, I said, listen, you know, I really want you to be there, but I only want you to be there if you can be there with support. And if you can't be there supporting me, then it's totally fine. You don't have to come. But I I really just didn't want him. I was like, but I just come because you want to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, and what, no matter what, like my sisters and mom says in terms of pressuring you to come, like this is a decision you have to make. And so I came to terms with it. And, you know, I, I didn't know my dad was coming until he walked through the doors of the venue. And so I was like, okay, he's here. But by that point, I had kind of like come to terms with him coming or not coming. But I was, of course, I'm so happy he was there. But I'm really grateful that they came. You know, our moms walked us down the aisle. And yeah, they're amazing. I don't know how, like, I can't, that is even, amazing. I can't even imagine, you know, 
being an immigrant, coming here, and then having your child be your first an actor. Yeah, that first an actor, and also oh like your own, your only son. Yeah. You know, it's like there's a lot there. Um, so it speaks to their their love and generosity and their progressiveness, even though they are pretty conservative. It's an ongoing journey. Definitely. You know, like. I think this is the first time I'm actually really talking publicly about it. Not that I've been hiding it, but also I've never had the opportunity and no one's really asked. So no one's like really cared. Um, but, you know, we're supposed to go on this big family trip to Korea in the summer. And, you know, I'm I'm not really out to my extended family. Um, I mean, you know, my cousins and whatever We're on Facebook. I think they've all kind of mm -hmm. assumed and figured mm -hmm. it out. But, you know, like I, I don't really have that much family left in Korea, but I have some. And it's something that I'm thinking about, too, like, you know, we're, we're supposed to go with everybody and you know michael's welcome and he's going to be going too and it's like how do we but testing I, your parents you know year after year, I, have it's nothing but a, I have nothing but a challenge <laughs> um but i hope that you know if there's any lgbtq folks listening to this that are korean american that you know i hope that your families are as a support as supportive as mine but it does take work and it is difficult i don't know i don't think everybody has a happy ending like i do in yeah. terms of that yeah. but um there are many of us out there, and I think that's also why finding your tribe is important. Because you have your you have your biological family, and you have your chosen family, and sometimes your you know your chosen family definitely provides things that your biological family cannot. Definitely the case with me too. So, how did being a gay Asian American actor impact your career or life, or how you went about finding your people? Though I've always been out, I think um, early on in my career, it was definitely a concern. I was, I don't want to say I was closeted, but I, I definitely didn't like lead with it. But as I've gotten older and more comfortable in my own skin, and then also definitely being married now, you know, like you can't hide that, you know what I mean? So um, I feel like I've been more vocal about it now that I'm married. And also I kind of don't care anymore. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, there's so many bigger fish to fry than that little part of it you know but it was a concern early on in my career now i don't it doesn't bother me as much i know that there's been so many actors who have been working for years and you've been acting since you were a child and the fact that just this past august it's seen that you know it's asian august it feels almost like wow your time has come yeah i think it's also generational you know what I mean? Like, so there are many people now infiltrating the industry from multiple angles on the executive side, on the creative side, on the content side, on the writing side, on the directing side. There's just there are just more of us now. More doing, people in the room. In the room. Yeah. yeah. You know, whereas like 20 years ago, that was that's a generation ago, right? Like there weren't nearly as many. So I think that's part of this wave because of there's just so many more of us in the industry. And that's having a real impact. I'm, I'm very hopeful, you know, because I think it's really, it's the numbers. Like there's so many of us now and creating and making art and like really like integrated into American culture and society. So it doesn't feel like a flash in the pan, you know, whereas like in the 80s, mm -hmm. it kind of, mm -hmm. it was, you know, so I'm, I'm very hopeful, not even just like as an actor, I'm just I'm hopeful because I think about my nieces and nephews who are, you know, anywhere between like seven and 18 and just having themselves reflected. You know what I mean? Like, because we didn't have that, mm -hmm. you know? And unfortunately, we don't even know what the toll of that on us is. So I'm just really excited for this other generation that's coming up to have themselves empowered in the way that we weren't. I think that's why. Like I said, mentorship and being able to provide opportunities for others is so meaningful and impactful. And, you know, change can happen in very small ways. I think even with my story about um, coming out and my, my family, I don't know if my parents would really ever uh, experience any of those, those <laughs> things if they didn't have a son that was gay. So do your parents love saying that I have a son who went to Yale? Oh, my God. Yes. And I now teaches, I teaches at, at Princeton. Princeton. <laughs> Holy smokes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> My dad leads with the Princeton thing now, you know, <laughs> like you don't need to know anything else about me except that I teach at Princeton. But yeah, they were very excited when I 
got into Yale and then um, this teaching opportunity came up at Princeton, which is, they're very, very excited about it. I think it gives them bragging rights for many years. Oh, yeah. I think it makes up for the whole like gay son Mary thing, you know, it bounces <laughs> it out somewhere. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so silly. I mean, it's very, it's very prestigious. It's very, I'm so honored, but it's also like, <sighs> It's like, why? You got to throw your parents yeah, a bone sometimes, <laughs> right? Come on. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, want, I just wanted to say I'm a big fan of Korean American story. And um, I'm so grateful for what you guys do. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk with you and for you guys, you know, amplifying our Korean American voices. It was so lovely to hear your story. Thank you. K-Pod is a production of KoreanAmericanStory.org. Our producer is Kevin Park. Our editor is AJ Valente. And our executive producer is H.J. Lee. You can email us with comments and suggestions at kpod at KoreanAmericanStory.org. You can see Juliana's portraits of our guests and some behind-the-scenes photos at KoreanAmericanStory.org. You can follow Juliana on Instagram at Juliana underscore Son. For news and updates on K-Pod, follow Korean American Story on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook.